All right. So, standing agenda, let's get our attendance. So, I have um, Joseph. I have Lisa. I have Melissa. I have um, Jordan Lewis. Anybody else? This is Shannon <laughs> I have oh, sorry, Jonathan. I have Jonathan with K A I. Anyone else? Shannon Thompson. Larissa McLennan. Okay, Shannon. And Shannon, remind us again what group you're from. Uh, okay. Carl T. Curtis, uh, nursing home in Mason, Nebraska. Oh, we're so happy to have you on the call. Thank you. Did I hear someone named Larissa? Yes, Larissa with K A I. Yes, and Larissa is now working with Julie Cahoon, right, Larissa? Yes. L-A-R-I-S-A. -S -S did I get that right? You did. McLennan. M-C-L-E-N-N-O-N. I, I remember you got from it. our call on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Shannon, can you spell your last name for us again? S-A-U-N-S-O-C-I. Did I hear Joseph on the call as well? Uh, this is Mike Harris. I'm I'm sitting in for Ron Ross. Ron is uh, uh, meeting today, and he asked me to sit in. And Ron's with Native American Health Management. Thank you, Mike. Welcome. Thank you. And this is Chrissy Thank Hudgens you. from ACL. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. We're talking over to um, each other. Uh, Chrissy, I I caught most of your intro. Can you just run by your last name and where you're from, real quick? Sure. Hudgens and from ACL, Administration for Community Living. And then we have another person um, talking as well that I didn't catch. Teresa Holt from the Long-Term Care Ombudsman. Oh, hi, Teresa. Joseph Ray from Laguna Rainbow Center in Laguna Pueblo, New Mexico. Hi, Joseph. Great to hear your voice. Thanks, Lisa. So I'm just going to do a real quick um, last roll call, if you don't mind, Debbie, just to make sure I've got folks, everybody accounted for. And I'm going to do first names pretty quickly, um, and then at the end I'll pause to see if I've missed anyone. I've got Lisa, Jordan, Jonathan, Shannon, Melissa, Debbie, Larissa, Mike, Chrissy, Teresa, and Joseph. Did I miss anybody? All right, great. Thanks. Debbie, all yours. All right. So, and Shannon, you're the administrator there, correct? The deputy administrator. Excellent. So we want to give you a chance to give us any updates. Okay. Um, any new members on the call, Lisa? Any new members? Uh, well, Shannon hasn't always been on the call. Anyone else that is kind of new to the call? I think, Mike, you may be new on the call as well. Yeah, this is the first time I've participated, yes. Okay. Mike? Mike, what, where are you from? Native American Health Management in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm sitting in for Ron huh? today, Ron Ross. Oh, very good. Okay, excellent. He was on the call on Monday. Yeah, he told me he was. And he's at a meeting today or a conference in, uh, this afternoon. Well, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. That's awesome. And our Welcome. calls are being recorded, just so everybody knows that. Um, they're placed on the CMS.gov website. Are there any changes in anyone's contact information? Okay. We do have a guest, kind of a guest speaker today, Dr. Jordan Lewis, talking on cultural humility. Um, I do not have any updates specifically from NICOA, from NCAI, from the National Indian Health Board. Um, I did want to announce that the GWEP, I have a call next week with the University of Arizona. They may get funded for one more year, so that's good news. I have a call with that group to see um, how that's looking, because otherwise that funding will end on June 30th of this year. Um, we're happy to have um, Lisa with our Alaska QIO on the call. I did see Keith Chartier a couple of weeks ago. I was up at Health Service Advisory Group in Phoenix for a presentation on antibiotic stewardship, so I did talk to Keith and that group. Um, do we have any other QIOs or ombudsmen on the call today? Any other QIOs or ombudsmen? Okay. If you'll notice the new list. Uh, Debbie, I don't know. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Teresa Holt from Alaska, our ombudsman's on the call. Oh, she is. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Okay. Sorry, Teresa. I missed you. 
I'm glad you're on the call. Very good. Um, so we'll give you a chance to give us an update. Um, uh, let me think if there's anything else. Um, okay. And so we're going to give um, our, uh, let's see here. Why don't we have Teresa, why don't you just, or Lisa, why don't you just give us a quick update on your world if there's anything that you think would be helpful to the folks on the call as far as from your perspective? Um, I, I think just in the interest of you've got a full enough agenda, I don't have anything really exciting or, or shattering to share, so I'd love to give the time back to our speakers. Okay, that's fine. Um, anything with the ombudsman? Any anything, Teresa, going on specifically that just you want to mention quickly? Okay, not, I'm not sure where Teresa where she is. Um, Jonathan with KAI, do you want to just give us a quick update on where we are on best practices? You or Larissa? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, Currently, we have completed the best practices report that we did on cultural humility. Uh, it was approved by CNS, and we are in the process of making that document favorite compliant and getting it posted to the Unite page on the TA Center. Okay, so and Jonathan, posted, that was, how many people were interviewed for that? Make sure you guys are muting your phone so there's not so much background noise. When was that, um, when was, how many people were interviewed for that again? Uh, we interviewed five people for that. Five people. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And when is our, our next one you said is due when? Just a reminder. It, it is due um, in June, June 1st. Okay. And that one, folks, is going to be on quite, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say that's going to be on financial sustainability. Right. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, on our steering committee call on Monday, uh, we had a long conversation. Um, Cynthia LeCount was on that call, which I'm really pleased to say, and also Ron Ross. And we picked up some really good information. Uh, that information, along with more discussion from this group, will be presented at our uh, July webinar. And so um, we're working on that right now. Um, so anything else, Jonathan? Um, can I just ask a quick question? I didn't quite hear the topic. I heard the word sustainability, sustainability, but I didn't catch the first part. Financial. Financial, Financial. sustainability. Okay, Financial thank sustainability. you. Got you. Right. Thank you. So one of the things you said that we talked about on the call was kind of this whole idea of, you know, long-term support service and really bringing tribal nursing homes into that piece. Um, I know that, Cynthia, uh, we are going to have, just so you guys know, our annual meeting. is. We did confirm some dates with Cynthia, and um, that's going to be with the 40th anniversary Title VI conference. It's going to be in Washington, D.C., and we're looking at doing some advocacy on the Hill with that. Um, and so I'll be talking to Cynthia a little bit more about that and then reporting back to everyone. So that is going to be the week of August 6th. I believe that's what we said. Jonathan, you were on that call Monday. That was correct, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the week of August 6th. So if you want to put that on your calendar that week, that'll be our Unite annual meeting and we'll be part of that Title VI conference in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. So we, we will have some opportunities there to do some advocacy work and maybe some meetings with some other folks. So that's really exciting. Um, and I'd like to thank KAI for doing the emailing so well with the newsletter now. So everyone remember the newsletter deadline is the first Wednesday of every month. So for the April um, newsletter, it'll be April 4th, that Wednesday. And then um, KAI puts the announcement out the week before. So they'll put that out the 12th. Our next meeting will be the 19th. And the steering committee in April will be on the 9th, which is good, so it doesn't fall in the same week as the monthly meeting like it did this month. So thank you all for, for that, for participating. Okay, and I'd like, um, Shannon, would you just like to give us a, a little bit from your world with the from an administrator's point of view? Uh, I've been deputy administrator for the past six months oh. of working, um, working as AIT in that period of time, so just waiting to take my board. Um, okay. um, been at 
Carl T. Curtis Nursing Home is a 25-bed ICF facility. Um, we have approximately 19 residents right now. Okay. So we're on on the reservation, so been here since 19 uh, mid 1970s. Wow! Wow! So, did you hold other jobs at the facility prior to being the administrator, deputy administrator? Yeah, I actually worked on the health at our health center because it's umbrellaed into so many different programs here. Um, okay. Worked at the business office and um, had the chance. And the CEO asked me if because I had all the education. She said, "Well, would you like to try something different?" Um, Part of going having administrator after administrator after administrator, so she asked if I wanted wow. to go back to, uh, go back to school. So I said, "Yeah, sure, why not?" <laughs> so we're, I'm a tribal member also. So good, excellent. Mm-hmm. So did you go back to school in business or in healthcare? Um, I went back for um, nursing home administrator school at Southeast Community College in Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay. We, um, I should be. Yeah, I just finished that course in December, so I'll be graduating in May, June. Excellent. June. That's great. Okay. Well, I'm well, a beginner and still learning. And it's <laughs> lots of learning. Yeah. Had ex- had a, yeah, I had an excellent preceptor, and she's really old school and strict, too. So she had 30 years in. Yeah. Are you surveyed um, federally or by your state? How are you surveyed? Um, we're surveyed by our state. Um, we okay. just had, yeah, annual in October and had to deal with all the F tags and uh, citations. Yeah, not good. Okay. <laughs> well, well we're, off just, we have, we're off of everything, thank God. Okay. Probation okay. Probation for three months and it was hectic. Okay. Okay. All right. You see, Miss, uh, did you say you were, this is Joseph Ray in New Mexico. Did you say you were in Nebraska? Yep. Or Alaska? Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Nebraska. <laughs> I like my cold weather, but thought, Alaska well, is probably too cold. Well, I was thinking, did I hear her say Nebraska the second time? And if so, she's doing uh, distance learning, but I, so that's why I wanted to clarify. No, you, you're in Nebraska. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And just to give you all some, I was just, just literally minutes before I got on this call, um, there was a point click care webinar about the survey, the new survey process. And they did say on that um, call that the across the country, this is very current, hot off the press information, um, that the top three citations right now across the country on surveys are infection control. Um, dining, excuse me, dining, kitchen sanitation, and accidents and incidents. So just be aware of that. If you want any more information, I'm going to type up a document and have Julie send it out to everybody. But it was just kind of some things to have ready when the surveyors walk in, some really good practical advice. So it was it was a webinar really worthwhile listening to. So, Okay, great. Um, don't forget to check out the CMS.gov website. All of our best practice reports are there. Don't forget to look at periodically at our um, website for our collaborative for Unite. Um, that's still under tribalnursinghomes.weebly.com, W-E-E-B-L-Y, so that's still there. Um, and we're going to just skip through our updates on dementia and traditional foods. And um, I told you about the annual meeting, so that's good. Let's go ahead and have um, Dr. Lewis share a little bit. Um, So we decided back last October at our annual meeting that our um, topic, our clinical topic for this calendar year would be on cultural humility. I think we started out saying cultural competence and we decided that wasn't the best term. And so um, we're just going to have an open, a little bit open discussion about that and how everyone thinks about that, what's been your experience with that, and some, you know, kind of thinking about some best practices that we can share on our webinar about this topic. So, all right, Dr. Lewis? All right. Well, 
Good afternoon to some of you. Good late morning to some of us up here in Alaska. Uh, it's an honor to be invited to come speak again. Um, I know I've been trying to catch this group for a few times, but um, it's spring break this week here for our students, so it's been really quiet and nice to be able to catch up. Um, but I wanted to just, I, I want this to be very informal, just kind of have a conversation. This topic comes up a lot. Um, it's coming up a lot more in our medical school curriculum, but being trained as a social worker and working with older adults, cultural competency, cultural humility is a, a topic we use a lot in terms of how do we approach working with clients, patients, residents, students. Uh, it fits in any environment, really. But uh, starting off with this idea, you know, cultural competency, I, I believe, is still a valid approach to work. Um, the literature and, you know, trying to keep up with what's happening in gerontology and social work and psychology uh, in my professional areas, this idea of cultural competency gives this notion that you get a certificate or there's an endpoint where you can then deem yourself as competent within a culture that's not your own. Um, and so there are, you know, depending on which author you read, which research, which training you go to, um, they still use that term, which is completely fine. And it's it has served as the foundation of what we're doing now in terms of moving towards this idea of cultural humility. Uh, so cultural competency to me seems like it says I'm the expert, I'm here, you know, I can I can navigate your culture, whether it's a nursing home culture, an indigenous culture, it's a culture of youth. Um, you know, culture is a very broad topic. Uh, there's cultures everywhere. Uh, and shifting that more to cultural humility places the expertise and the people you're working with. Uh, so rather than saying I'm the expert, uh, which I get a lot working in communities, you know, I have the PhD behind my name, I've been doing research with older adults for X amount of years, communities automatically put that assumption on me saying, well, you tell us what to do. And then using the cultural humility approach, I say, well, you're the experts, you're from the community, you live in this facility, or you are from this culture, you train me on what to do. Uh, and so... You know, the idea that I, and from this is my perspective, I will never be competent enough in one, one of the cultures that I could call myself an expert. But through using cultural humility, I think what we can do is start thinking about what are the questions we can ask ourselves as we self-reflect on our own biases? Um, what are we bringing from our own background, our own culture, our own training that will influence our interactions with other cultures? Uh, and so... What kind of questions can we ask of residents, of people we work with, people we do research with? Um, so one, admit that we don't know everything, but make it safe to make ask questions. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of elders, and I tell them, you know, I'm not the expert, so if I make, a, make an assumption or ask a question that's, you know, it's not appropriate or I do something that's not appropriate, teach me so I know how not to do it the next time, uh, and I can educate others. And usually elders can be gracious about it, no laugh, and they'll tell you, no, that's not the right way. Um, and so I think of this idea of um, self-reflection, you know, I think about what biases do I bring, what kind of things do I carry when I work with different cultures, you know, I'm traveling the country doing work. Um, we all have different ideas of different regions of the United States and parts of the world that are based on these ideas of our culture and Thinking about, you know, how do we define culture? There's, if you think about, I'm sure a lot of us have seen the, the culture iceberg, the top that's visible to people on top of the water, the visible things of culture, skin color, how you dress, the language you speak. But underneath are all the aspects of culture that we don't see automatically until you start asking questions and learn the story of the person you're working with. So it could be religious beliefs. It could be how they prepare their food at home, uh, how they were brought up. Uh, and so... The I you know challenging ourselves to think okay you know one question I always say you know ask elders where are you from who's your family what are your favorite foods that opens up this other aspect of culture we don't typically think about a lot um, when we automatically start talking to people or see people and thinking about cultural humility we need to start thinking about also the idea that generational differences exist. For example, you know, the older elders, the elder, older, older adults are from a different generation than our young old elders. Uh, and so how do those generational differences influence the culture they're from? Um, 
you know, just thinking about my great grandparents aged at home until they were 93. They grew up in a sod house in a vill- you know, in the village of Naknik before it was known as Naknik. And they lived through all these generations of changes to where they had a car, they had a TV, um, cell phones weren't around back then before they passed. But thinking about, you know, if you're having conversations and you're approaching an elder, figuring out, you know, what are the generational impacts they have on their experiences and what do they bring to that facility you're working in um, and being aware that we need to ask questions and not make assumptions. And so thinking about, you know, what kind of skills would this be? Um, you know, what, how can we improve or think about what does cross-cultural humility look like? One, just have a general knowledge. Be, be okay with asking questions. Be okay with making mistakes. You know, what are some of the common behaviors, common practices? Be aware of the history. You know, thinking about American Indians and Alaska Natives, historical trauma. Um, being aware that the history is there. Uh, and what role does that play in their current situation? Ask questions with their patients and residents and whoever you're working with, what their specific preferences might be. Um, you know, we learned the other day from, we were talking to Don Thibodeau up at Denali Center, and he jokingly said, you know, one of the things the elders tell me is that a lot of our people that work with us or bring food in from the community is that they put a lot of sauce on salmon. And the elders say, well, you know, that's, you know, that's great, but we were raised with keeping it very simple and plain with maybe salt and pepper. So we, very, we learned through hearing others their very specific preference of how they wanted their salmon prepared. Um, but we wouldn't have known if we didn't, you know, ask, you know, ask elders what are their favorite recipes, what, you know, where are you from, because Indian country is very diverse. Uh, even in Alaska, you know, just because you're you pick things are very different, or even within Aleuts, the Aleuts in one region pair things differently. So thinking about some skills, um, I think we need to think about, and of course this is going to vary because I think, you know, cultural humility is very subjective. It's not, I can't give everyone a list of questions and we're all going to be very humble about culture and diversity and, and the settings we work in. Um, but thinking about what kind of questions, you know, was it, where are you from, what are your favorite kind of foods, um, you know, asking feelings feeling comfortable enough by asking about race or upbringing or their ethnicity. Uh, you know, we worked with some elders a couple weeks ago here, and we were hearing stories from one of them. Uh, when she was younger, she went to New York City, and they thought she was Asian-American. Uh, she's actually she's like, no, I'm actually a Nubiat. Um, and so we can. She's like, you know, but it's okay. They should have asked. Um, so we need to be comfortable with ourselves and our biases to ask those kind of questions that may, you know, may not come across as, something you ask someone generally, um, but uh, other ones would be, you know, religion, relationships, social support, healthcare beliefs, um, and having a set of questions in your back pocket that may start that conversation, because I think once you ask one question and it opens that door, they're open to more questions. Um, other ways we could use, you know, become more culturally humble, you know, being comfortable with translators or asking that question and being okay with saying, well, do you feel comfortable speaking in your native language? Uh, because, again, I can't know everything, uh, and we shouldn't make individuals feel uncomfortable because it's more comfortable for us. You know, we can think about cultural humility. So what is our role in the healthcare team, you know, a lot of us work in settings where we're working with other professions, you know, nurses, doctors, um, ENAs, community health aides. Um, how do we demonstrate cultural humility with other populations and other health professions as well? Because um, we all do different aspects of our jobs. Uh, and we all come with our own culture. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I'm just a mutt from, I don't even know where my parents are from. They're probably just white from somewhere. But we all have a culture no matter what. Uh, and, you know, one elder told me, know your history, it gives you strength, even if you're not indigenous. You know, we all have a history. We all come from a line of people that have given us the skills and what we have today. And so that's how I think cultural humility is a little different than cultural competency. In the social work field, you know, we get this idea, and I still hear social work students saying, well, you know, I'm culturally competent in working with disabilities. Well, you know, that's that's a broad, I mean, you can feel comfortable working with that environment, but that person, that population, but are you really competent unless you are someone from that community? And I would even argue, you know, I 
being raised, born and raised in Bristol Bay, being a commercial fisherman, I still don't think I'm completely competent in my own culture. Um, so those are just, I just wanted to throw out those ideas as talking points, uh, the difference between competency and humility. Uh, and I would like to say there's no right or wrong answer. We all, as I said, it's very subjective. So I think those are just some ideas that I have uh, in terms of those two constructs and how we think about the people we work with. Uh, and we'd be happy to answer questions, open dialogue. Uh, and I have a lot of resources if people are interested in seeing some of the resources that are coming out in terms of healthcare. Um, there are a few articles and publications around cultural humility in nursing homes um, that I can share that is coming out. Um, but I welcome any feedback, questions, comments, discussion. Because I'm, I'm not the expert, just sharing what I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was excellent. I was typing away. Um, anyone else? Anyone would like to maybe open a little more on something Dr. Lewis just spoke said? Well, this is Lise on Alaska, and I just I just have to say I feel very, very fortunate that we've got Dr. Lewis in our state and, and people like Melissa as well that I can reach out to um, because I'm just a little white girl from the lower 48, and so I, and I've been in Alaska for 25 years, and I'm still learning, and will continue to learn um, cultural humility. And I don't think I'll ever be culturally competent in the Alaska culture. Um, but again, just for our caregivers, I think, and we've got so many Alaska natives in all of our nursing homes. This is just great um, food for thought and. I'll look forward to working with you more on this and other projects, Jordan. Great. Thank you. We're excited yeah. here in Alaska, too. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Anyone else? There's a lot of uh, points here, um, Dr. Lewis, that we could pick up on. Um, I kind of thought of something at the very end a little bit, um, and that is how, in your experience, are there people that kind of reject our culture because, like, maybe they were raised a certain way, but then they've kind of tweaked it or modified it or stepped away from parts of it? What are your thoughts on that? I think so. I think that would be, you know, I think it's excellent maybe. I don't, I don't, I'm just saying this based on my experience of working with older adults. I think this comes with boarding school era. I think there's some older adults I work with where they're ashamed of their dancing or their language. And so that part of their culture definitely is not at the forefront of conversations we have with them or an integral part of what they consider as healthy aging. Um, I think that's, I think that's, something that's ingrained in them, but it also, they see a positive light in the future when the youth are bringing this, the language back, bringing back the dancing, um, and that they can, they'll know that when they pass on, the future generations are bringing back what they grew up with. Um, but I would say there are definitely some older adults I've worked with where they have left part of their culture and it's not a part of their life, and it's even sometimes it doesn't even come up and we don't push it. Um, and others have brought it back and they've used their culture and the, the stuff, the things of, of their upbringing back into their life to help heal through difficult situations where they may have experienced substance abuse or domestic violence as a result of a lack of connection to their culture and bringing that back into their life has helped them heal. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I'd be an interesting study too to look at what parts of culture are not or what do they leave behind, or what do they ever bring back? For the purposes of our um, upcoming um, best practices and, you know, continued conversation on this, I'm a very visual person, and Jordan, when you, or Dr. Lewis, when you describe culture being like the iceberg, and the, we see the 10% on top is, you know, the clothes or the color of the skin or whatever, and that I, I heard what you said is sort of culture is leading, needing to learn the story of the person. So mm -hmm. in other words, that 90% we're not seeing underneath 
um, the iceberg. But I think that might be a really great visual if we're going to put anything formal out there just to yeah. get – I think that really, to me, is a great visual to remind me that when I look at someone, I'm only seeing 90% of, quote, quote, their culture. Yeah. 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 I was like, 10% other way around. Yeah. I would be happy to work on putting stuff together and share that with the group and we can fine tune it. I think we'll we'll get a PowerPoint kind of going and then people can just edit it and work with it and modify it as we go. Um, I like that as part of that title even, Lisa, maybe something like cultural humility, learning the story of the person or learning the story of the elder specifically. You know, yeah. how do we learn? You know, and that that's really, big... I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. No, I was just going to say that that really is a price applies so broadly that I can use that in my work regardless of if it's a tribal nursing home or not because Petersburg, for example, has a, a, a lot of um, folks from the Norwegian parts of the world. And, again, you know, that's having cultural humility or is just being respectful and trying to understand who's in front of me and what's important to them. Right. Do you, I mean, it's interesting. And Shannon, are you still on the call? I'm, I'm wondering with, um, with this webinar, if we can maybe have several tribes kind of showcased in terms of, you know, like if Shannon, if you're a member of a certain tribe or maybe Melissa or someone that you would be willing to, be on this webinar and just kind of talk about some things you've seen, you know, as a, you know, kind of like to present that and then we can kind of pull out some points from that, you know, like what Dr. Lewis was talking about, like being comfortable versus being competent or, you know, that type of thing, the relationships or social support or religion or food. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, would be, I would be willing to. And that's what we're slowly trying to transition into our nursing home because administrative staff have have been non native for years and years and years and and yeah. now that jobs and people are quitting and whatnot or are moving to different jobs um it's it's um and more of our people are getting their education and so now we have a little bit to work with that are educated finally. Yeah. And qualified to be in these positions, so um, it's going to be a slow transition, and that's what we're aiming for is probably at least 100% Native um, Native people in our nursing home because there's not, not too many on the administrative side, but we have lots of CNAs and, and a few LPNs, and that's about it, and that's what that's what we deal with here, and it goes back and forth. And it's not a pretty sight on the cultural site because not, a lot of our non-natives don't understand. And that's we've had many staff meet, meetings, and you know, it, it, it's it's kind of scary how because we are on the reservation, you know, and and when people get terminated and whatnot. They are still continuing after two or three months later, and our non-native staff get scared, and so they quit. You know, and but to be to bring light of the whole situation, it's um, the culture diversity. We just had a probably activities director that started in October, so she has brought Native American church, and um, she has devotions up here and whatnot, and. She takes them to our cultural um, dances, war dances, and war dances, and hand games, and so she's has she has opened up the door for more of our cultural side than it has been since we've opened. Mm -hmm. So it's that's interesting. That's mm -hmm. that's interesting. And you're which. I'm sorry, I should know this, but what tribe is that that you're most, is everyone's a member of the same tribe or is it different? Um, just about all tribal, Omaha tribal, Omaha tribe. Oh. Is it just the Omaha tribe or are there, because I thought there were, I remember um, before, weren't there, there's different Omaha tribes or no? No, just one. 
yeah. Omaha One. tribe, okay. and then we have a neighboring tribe um, to us about nine miles north, Winnebago tribe, and then we have, San okay. we have Santee. So we have three, three and a half. No, um, Northern Ponca does not have a reservation here, so okay. It's, Okay. They're recognized here in the state of Nebraska. Okay. Okay. So four total. Um, and and you know that's really um, I think that that piece about um, you know all the, you know becoming you know staffed with all tribal members. I, I mean I know here that's something that was you know a long like you say it might take a while but that's a long been a long term goal here too. Sherry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's, that might be even a good thing to bring up when we talk about this a little bit, too. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Joseph, you're on the call. Any thoughts on that, on this? Um, just to thank you for the presentation, um, Jordan, Dr. Lewis. And um, uh, my comment is, um, again, at our Laguna Rainbow Center, which is a 58-bed, 56-bed facility, uh, non-skilled nursing. We, we've had we've had many many um, administrators. Um, it's been about twenty years since we've had a person of native uh, descent that was our administrator, and um, it's it, so it's been difficult working with the management organization and the administrators that they've um, brought to us here at Laguna. Um, we've. Um, I'm I'm a member of the board, so in in our um, meetings and if, excuse me, in our um, management agreement, we do stress cultural uh, awareness. But uh, I think um, the it just isn't understood what that really, really, truly means to the resident um, cultural, and, and it's all different levels. But it it's it goes from deep devotion to the to the to the um, native custom and religion to just a uh, um, to just a, a need to know basis where they where the folks just want to be know uh, to know that the the um, the ceremonies and culture survives locally and that they're comfortable in their place. So again. Somewhere down the road, we'll have this uh, understanding between our, our organizations. As well, and as uh, um, um, as we bring in more native administrators, uh, native personnel on that administrative level, then um, then things I think will be, I guess, changing and make uh, change made for the better for the future. But uh, suggestion when we go to the annual Title Six conference in D.C. is um, that we um, start developing, or even before that, excuse me, um, building on this um, component of uh, our care for our residents, because again, I, I yeah. it's, it's really important. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to just say a word about where the when you were in D.C. in February, just anything? I didn't know if you wanted to just mention anything from that. Um, well, um, I was I was in Washington D.C. as part of the National Congress of American Indians um, uh, executive session, as it's called, and it uh, um, it just gives us an opportunity, gives members an opportunity to um, advocate for their cause um, um, uh, and meet with um, um, congressmen and senators on a one-to-one -one basis. I. Um, on this trip, I took advantage of some of the um, uh, relationships that I've been building over the year, especially with the um, um, uh, administration for community living, and um, and the um, national um, uh, national council on independent living, the um, consortium of administrators for Native American vocational rehabilitation, and you know. Um, I'm trying to bring all these um, people together to so that we can um, uh, brainstorm and create um, avenues to um, enable our um, our elders and near elders to age 
in their own home communities as long as possible. So, uh, again, I'm working on different aspects of our aging, and that my focus, again, is um, working with people with disabilities and ensuring that they have the proper resources to um, uh, enable them to age in their own homes and communities. So um, I brought together, I was able to, again, um, develop this uh, um, relationship, um, future collaboration with the AC, with uh, ACL, and hopefully we'll build on that in the future. But I, I think um, as far as this this effort goes, there's, um, there's different people working on it in different parts of the country. And so bringing us all on the same page is my goal, and it's just it's going to be a lifetime work. So thank you about that. You know, yeah. Yes. And I thank you, Joseph. Um, that was the national council on what? Independent living. Independent living. Okay. Um, I, I think we, we have a good relationship right now. The CLA camp was on our steering call on Monday. And I think that went really well. And just what Joseph said right now about this kind of, kind of brainstorming and create avenues to age it, it's aging to, and then again that's kind of that melding together kind of like title six and you know home health and tribal nursing homes because you know what we're all working with the same elders and the fact of the matter is they leave here and they go out in the community and then they come back here and so i think you know looking at ways maybe to bring that together and create these avenues where they can move back and forth in ways that are you know, very respectful in ways that, um, you know, are very tribal. And, and some of that might be resources, like Joseph said. Some of that might be training. And some of that's going to be advocacy, which we all, when we started Unite almost four years ago now, we, we talked about that, that that's something that we could do. And I think, Joseph, we probably need a little subcommittee to talk a little bit more about our annual meeting and, you know, who we might want to reach out to and schedule maybe some meetings with. So that's probably going to be a topic for one of the next steering committee meetings. Um, all right. Anyone else have any thoughts on this? It's about 12.54 right now. So we got about six minutes. So this is Teresa. Hey, Teresa. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to get in earlier, and, and my head said is malfunctioning or something, and by the time I figured out that you couldn't hear me, I wasn't on mute, but something was wrong. Anyway, right. um, one, one thing I wanted to bring up that um, we see a lot of um, pain and suffering resulting from facilities not knowing the um, traditions when somebody passes away. Oh. And so I think when you're talking about that and you're talking about questions to ask, um, and I know that Don Thibodeau has talked about this, too, that when somebody comes to his facility, he needs to get very specific information from that particular family um, mm -hmm. because everybody does it different. And, so, you know, if it's a village upriver from, you know, the village, a different village, they do it differently. Um, but okay. we see a lot of stress for, for elders who are in that facility and um, who know that the body was not taken care of the right way and it stresses mm -hmm. them out. So, Teresa, my understanding, and <clears throat> Dr. Lewis, if you're still on the call, maybe you can pipe up too, but that uh, Fairbanks uh, Denali Center where Don Thibodeau works, part of their intake assessment is to have conversations around end of life because, as Teresa pointed out, there have been um, some, uh, and I don't know a Denali Center in particular, but I know just historically there have been some lessons learned in terms of, uh, for example, even who notifies the family that the resident has passed. In some um, particular groups, it's um, preferred to have the priest give that notification versus a medical professional. So little things like that, I know Don has spoken with my, my nursing home group, but that's a good point for me to bring up again, Teresa, so thank you for sharing. That is true, and the, the manual Don and I wrote, this is Jordan, contains a little bit of that. He, Don provided in that manual some questions we could start thinking about to ask at the intake to get kind of that sensitive information at the end of life. Um, 
And I'm not sure if I've shared that with everyone, but we do have electronic copies we could send out that covers that topic, but a lot of other topics as well. I'm sorry, I missed that. What do you have a copy of what? Don Thibodeau and I wrote a, a manual for care facilities on how to integrate culture into services. I need to get, I think you actually sent me that one time, but could you send it again? I will, yes. Thank you. Okay. I'll just, um, my, I'll add one comment because I, I think we need to also give thought to this. Um, um, in our facility, we have uh, Pueblo people and um, people of uh, Diné people. So in the long history of our, our, our tribes here, there's been, um, you know, um, rivalry and um, war. And so um, some of those folks still hold on to those biases against each other. And um, that's one thing I need, we need to incorporate into our um, curriculum as far as um, our management organizations that, that run our facilities, that partner with us in our facilities. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. And these these two things, like end of life and maybe rivalries between different, you know, people um, within the tribe, those actually might be really good points um, to kind of bring up as a case example, you know, for anyone that might be listening on on the webinar. That might be a good a good thing to do because um, we could certainly talk about that. Okay, anyone else? Did everyone get a chance? Mike, are you still on the call? Did you want to bring in anything or um, Melissa? I agree with what everyone else said, and thank you, Dr. Lewis, for presenting. It's very much needed not only in our healthcare system, but um, I kind of had a conversation with somebody on the political system in how to incorporate our indigenous languages for our voting um, population. So, thank you. Okay. So, in terms of voting, is that what you're saying? The language? Yeah. There's a uh, because of the federal law, there's um, requirements to have indigenous uh, translated documents, and so there's. Um, the meeting is occurring next week in, in that regard here in Alaska. Good. Good. Okay. For any kind of federal state election type of thing. There there this is Joseph again. Um there is the hearing field hearings going on that are being um held by the Native American Rights Fund that um are um wanting to have testimony of, regarding any aspect of uh, voting rights. So that'll be good to, for you to give that input if you can, Melissa. And um, I think uh, next month they're having two field hearings in California, but um, okay. that's through the Native American Rights Fund. Okay, that's the one. I met some of those people when we did that poster presentation at NCAI, right? Was that... I can't, I can't, I can't remember who, that gentleman's name, but you introduced me to someone who was active in that, right, in the voting rights. Oh, um, I'm not, re I don't really recall because a lot of those people change, but at okay. NCAI level, but um, yeah, okay. but um, uh, so anyway, thank you. All right. Native American Rights Fund, F-U-N-D, right? Okay. All right, for anyone that wants to look that up. Okay, well, I appreciate we're getting close to being done. In fact, it's 101 right now. So we're going to take all this. I would sincerely appreciate if Dr. Lewis, and I know there was some talk about possibly even Dom Thibodeau, Melissa, maybe Shannon or Joseph, if you guys would consider being our panelists for the May webinar. I'm not asking you to say yes or no today, but we are going to have to make decisions fairly quickly, probably within the next, I don't know, what do you think, Jonathan? When, when would you need to know the panelists by? Um, the sooner the better. Uh, yeah. If we could, if we could know by the beginning, middle of April. No, let's let's okay. say the beginning of April. Yeah. Okay. So before our next call, so I'll probably be in touch with all of you. I'm um, just seriously considerate. It would be Wednesday, 
May 23rd, which is actually the Wednesday before going into Memorial Day weekend. So I know Melissa and I had talked about this the other day, but if you do, if you would seriously consider um, being presenters, and I, I'd be happy to be the moderator like I have before um, and put together the PowerPoint with everyone's input. So, all righty. Thank you all very much. And put the week of August 6th on your calendars for our um, Title VI and the LTSS, um, um, our, our uh, UNITE meeting and some work with LTSS. Um, we'll, we'll discuss it a little more, but we're hoping to do another presentation, Lisa and Joseph, kind of like we did um, two years ago at the Title VI conference about tribal nursing homes. We're hoping to do another presentation like that. So we'll have to see who all will be going. But um, let's talk about that on our April call, okay? Debbie, Debbie, before yes. everybody leaves, the Title VI conference will be the week of August 13th. I will send that information. <clears throat> oh, well, that is not what I was <laughs> Did that just come out recently? Uh, I actually just received this email from Julie a few minutes ago. Oh, okay, okay. So it's going to be the week of August 16th? 13th. 13th. Okay. All right. Because I, when we had talked to her on Monday, she had said the week of August 6th. So that's fine. We'll go with that, folks. So the week of August 13th then. Okay. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if any of you get the compliance door for any assistance with, you know, F-tags and it's a great resource. But our disaster preparedness best practice report was actually on the compliance store website. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know how they pulled it. They got it off of CMS.gov. So it was actually on the compliance store. So I wanted to all let you know that. So thank you very much.